Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've decided to join us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is on the third quarter of 2012, a series that based on the two small books in the New Testament, First and Second Thessalonians. This particular lesson is lesson number 11. It's entitled, Promise to the Persecuted. It's an interesting one. I think you want to grab your Bible, open up to 2 Thessalonians, and we'll begin in just a moment after we pray together. Let's bow our heads. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for your holy presence among us, for the work of the Holy Spirit that inspired these writers to prepare and write out these messages from your hand. We ask that you will guide us in our understanding so that we may learn more of you to become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Promise to the persecuted. We know that these two small books were written to the church at Thessalonica where Paul had an opportunity of only about three weeks or maybe four weeks at the maximum to try to instruct and direct and, and build up the church there. Now he's down in Corinth, and Timothy is sort of running back and forth as a courier carrying these messages, and Paul is trying to build up the church there by straightening out some of the errors that seem to have arisen. Well, in all our lessons so far this quarter, we've been focusing on 1 Thessalonians. We now turn to 2 Thessalonians, which apparently was written very soon, probably within a few months after 1 Thessalonians. There is good evidence that, uh, uh, that it was a very short period of time. Many scholars suggested that the Thessalonians had misunderstood portions of Paul's first letter, and Paul was writing back to them to correct those misunderstandings. And my first question for you all to think about is, if God has foreknowledge and he knows exactly what's going to happen, why didn't he get it right the first time? He said he didn't get it right. Well, Paul wrote, and the message went to them, and they came up with all these misunderstandings. Jesus taught and taught and taught, and they came up with all kinds of misunderstandings. Hmm. You mean God has a problem with getting us to understand him? I think so. <laughs> Gordon. You mentioned that these books were written, probably written within a few months. I've heard it argued that since the messages are so different from each other, that it must have been a long time between these books. No. But, you know, all I have to do is go back and look at emails and say, you know, here's one <laughs> this morning and here's one an hour later. They look totally different. Yeah. yeah. Well, the first thing that r raises some interesting comments is, is found by comparing First Thessalon I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians 1 and 2. Uh, let's just read that for a moment. From Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the people of the church in Thessalonica who belong to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Notice the repetition there. God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you peace. Okay. Now, look what happens when we go to 1 Thessalonians, the, the first verse. <clears throat> From Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the people of the church in, Le in Thessalonica who belong to the God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be yours. Now, I'm reading from my Good News Bible, and you might have something a little different if you're looking at a different version. I don't know what all versions we have here today. Does anyone have anything significantly different in either of those? Well, there's the word ahar and so, and, and not okay. another. Okay. Anything else that's different? Well, the, the, the words about the Father and Lord Jesus Christ are repeated in 2 Thessalonians, are not repeated in... First Thessalonians, right? Some people thought in, in, in some of the early manuscripts decided that Paul had made a mistake in First Thessalonians. He should have included that our Lord Jesus Christ again, and so they just copied it over there. And most of the modern translations have now left it back out again. Well, Ellen White has some comments about that. 
The instruction that Paul sent the Thessalonians in his first epistle regarding the second coming of Christ was in perfect harmony with his former teaching. Yet his words were misapprehended by some of the Thessalonian brethren. They understood him to express the hope that he himself would live to witness the Savior's advent. So they said, Paul was here, he's older by our standards. Now we would say around about 50 or 55 wouldn't be that old today, but at least if you thought Jesus was coming within the lifetime of someone who was already 55, that's not very long, right? Um, no. This belief served to increase their enthusiasm and excitement. Those who had previously neglected their responsibilities and duties now became more persistent in urging their erroneous views. In his second letter, Paul sought to correct their misunderstanding of his teaching and to set before them his true position. He again expressed his confidence in their integrity and his gratitude that their faith was strong and that their love abounded for one another and for the cause of their master. He told them that he presented to them to, uh, he presented them to other churches as an example of the patient, persevering faith that bravely withstands persecution and tribulation, and he carried their minds forward to the time of the second coming of Christ, when the people of God shall rest from all their cares and perplexities. So there's a, a little bit of an explanation of some of the misunderstandings that were apparently uh, Is there. there a, can you say exactly what the misunderstanding was? Was it just the fact that they thought he was going to come during their lifetime? Is well, that the only thing? We're going to see as we study down here further that some thought maybe the second coming had already taken place. So that's a second possible misunderstanding. But did, did Paul himself say that uh, it was at hand? He told them, Paul and Timothy themselves. Well, that's one of the challenges of, of reading Second Thessalonians. <clears throat> We don't have, he says, you remember what I told you when I was with you, but we don't have that. So it's, it's a little bit, as some people have suggested, it's a little bit like listening, like listening to one side of a telephone conversation. We've got what Paul said, but we don't have what they said, or what they understood, or what their questions were. We don't have any of that. Right. Well, it's interesting in this Second Thessalonians, the word our, you mentioned that norm. Um, does that significantly change the meaning, do you think? Was Paul trying to help us to understand how important it is that we see Jesus, and a, Jesus as an exact likeness of the Father? We know that Jesus had repeated that he was just like the Father. Um, the, most, Go ahead. the most famous place is probably in John 14, starting with verse 7. Now that you have known me, he said to them, you will know my Father also, and from now on you, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, that's all we need. Jesus answered, For a long time I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe, Philip, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I have spoken to you, Jesus said to his disciples, Do not come from me. The Father who remains in me does his own work, and, and, and so forth. And there are other verses that support that same idea. Yes. Look, Paul is trying to get these people to believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. He made one attempt at it. He had it was kind of cut short. So it was if he he'd done that, it would seem to me perfectly in character for him to try to make that connection a little closer by saying our and the second time. I don't mm -hmm. think it means that the first one is wrong or anything like that. Well, <clears throat> you talked earlier about one of the issues about Christ Himself. How often did the people in Bible times and times of Jesus himself during his ministry directly misunderstand the words of Christ himself? Almost every time. <laughs> I hope it wasn't quite that bad. <laughs> well, but look at some examples. It, this is phenomenal. The Sanhedrin. Now, who were the Sanhedrin? They were the scholars of the day. The scholars, the, the, the Congress, they were the, the, the national leaders. These were supposed to be the thought leaders of the nation, right? The Sanhedrin was supposed, to be in, was supposed to be composed of the wisest and most intelligent people in the nation. Well, look at John 8, and we'll start with verse 24. Now, if you remember here, um, Jesus has done several things, and the Sanhedrin has called him to appear before them to answer some questions. And Jesus starts talking to them, and in the course of that conversation, he, he says these words from John 8, 24. 
That is why I told you that you will die in your sins, and you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am who I am. Now, when someone says in Hebrew, Aramaic in this case, <clears throat> I am who I am, what's the Hebrew or the Aramaic for that? Yahweh. Yahweh. That's the name of God. Jesus is saying here, don't you recognize that I'm God? Well, who are you, they asked him. They went on. They, they didn't seem to get it. So he says in verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing of my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. What has he done again? Claim to be God. Claim to be God again. Gave them they still, huh? And gave the religious leaders apoplexy. <laughs> well, they didn't get it. No, but... They, they didn't get it. So he went on and on. And finally, you know, down in verse 44, he says, You are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires, etc. Has there ever been a time that we know of in Earth's history when current scholarship got it right? Well, it depends on what you mean. The disciples eventually got it right. But look what it took them. Yeah. <laughs> look what they had uh, to go through. I, I think most of us would agree that uh, the Protestant reformers got most of it right. Um, we hope that our Adventist leaders got it right more but, for a little while, for a short time. Those reformers were in the minority. Oh, yeah. They were not the scholars of the day. No. We think they are, but in that time they were not. No, no, no. I, I'll agree with that. Finally, dropping down to John 8, verse 57, they said to him, You are not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? I am telling you the truth, Jesus replied. Now he just makes it so clear they can't possibly misunderstand. Before Abraham was born, I am. Then they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. I mean, when he finally just says, You can't miss this the third time, right? Third time and you're out, right? <laughs> Is it possible that they were so um, caught up in their opinion of what Jesus was, what he wasn't, that they heard the words and said, ah, that's not what he said. We misheard him. Well, what would that imply? What, what, why, would, why would that happen? That their paradigm was so out of touch with uh, reality. Is it possible that any of us at this table or any of our people, members of our church, our local church or our denomination are so sure of certain beliefs which in fact aren't right that God can't get the truth through to us? Well, I think that would correlate with miserable, poor, and wretched, and blind. You aren't talking about Laodicea, are you? I are. <laughs> But yet well, we're supposed to be so settled into the truth that we cannot be moved. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we have to face the deceiver who's coming, claiming to be God, and only, only a few will uh, understand. That's a huge challenge because on the one side we're supposed to be open to the truth, mm -hmm. and the other side we're supposed to be so settled in the truth that we cannot be moved. How There's do we balance. do that? Where's that balance? I think that's a balance that comes from daily connection with Jesus. It has to be. Yeah. has to be. Let, let me ask you about the word, the words, I am. Mm -hmm. Does it have such a strong double meaning to us as it does in no. Hebrew? No. To, to the Jews of Jesus' day, it was such a, a sacred word you, couldn't, you weren't even allowed to pronounce it. I am? Mm -hmm. Well, Yahweh. I am Yahweh. the Yahweh. What they call the so, ineffable. I don't quite understand why. Well, Yahweh in the Hebrew means Bible, let me just. I am. Like, we the, use I am lots of times. Yeah. I mean, in their sentences and yeah. everything. Uh, is it that exchangeable in Hebrew, too? No. We translate it as I am because we don't have any better way to translate it. Uh, so, well, technically, when, technically, it's more like to be. It, it's it's more like an infinitive. Well, yeah, so, I mean it's a it's a verb. Yeah, it's a verb. It's a state how, of how, being. How many is that what is that what happened when when Moses asked, "Who are you?" and he said, "I am. Mm -hmm. I'm the I am." Mm -hmm. 
So does, is it having that same effect? Well, it hopefully, yeah. To, to well, the I'm just, Jews. <laughs> I'm just a little confused on the meaning between the two. Well, it, you have a verb here that's used as a noun, a proper name, which is a very unusual situation. Okay? Uh, the Jews regarded it as the personal name of God. And when they were reading along in the Bible, if they came to that word, instead of saying Yahweh, they would be going, uh, be going this way for you TV audience, because they read from, from right to left. We read from left to right. They, they, wrote, they read from right to left. When they came to that word, instead of pronouncing Yahweh, they would pronounce Adonai. Where did it, the I am come from? Well, the I am is, a, is, a, is an attempt to try to translate the idea into English. So to get from, at, from, from Yahweh into English, we do it, I am. And uh, people have translated that in different ways. Some people have called it the eternal one, mm -hmm. or just the eternal, or the self-existent one, or... Well, I always thought it was, it was pretty incredible, you know, the words I am, because it's I am, it's trans, transitory, what do you call it? Mm -hmm. and there's nothing there. Yeah. Like, like you can fit anything there. You can fit any size of thing, any small thing. Everything is there. You know, it's almost like that's the only kind of name you can get from God that would really fit him, mm -hmm. you know, type of thing. I am it's history. I am future. I am present. All rolled into one. Now, how do you say that, that in English? Well, well, it's, it works in English, though. Yeah, it does. It does work As in I English. Am. But, so I, I just wonder if you did have a different paradigm and you kept saying I am, I am, I am, you keep turning the normal direction, you know, and then finally you got you got to shake him and say I am, you know, in here in the Bible I am. <laughs> so it's a connotation of the of the phrase I am in Hebrew Yahweh mm -hmm. that gave it this special meaning. Yeah, I understood it. I first understood it in French, really. And once you truly understand it, if the Holy Spirit help you to understand it, you will never fall for the e evolution and all this, because God is, mm -hmm. and ever was, and ever will be, mm -hmm. and period. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, but the process, somebody much wiser and smarter than I am, divided this whole process of getting an idea in God's head into somebody's head yeah. down here yeah. as three miracles. It takes a miracle for God to put a, a dream or a vision into somebody down here. Mm -hmm. It takes another miracle for that person to take words from his from his heritage and vocabulary and write that message out in a way that could be understood. Makes sense. And it takes another miracle mm -hmm. to get it from what we see as words on a page to get the right concept in our minds. So mm -hmm. it takes three miracles of God and any one of them can louse the whole process yeah, up. But it's actually more than that because there are other steps. There's translation, there's copying, there's da 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 da. There's, you know, if you start, you look at the entire biblical picture, you see that often it was God speaking through an angel yeah. to a prophet who writes it down, and then it has to be copied many, many, many times. Then it has to, it presumably accurately, hopefully, and then it has to be translated for those who don't read the original languages, and then it has to be, well, translated by different groups, and then finally it has to be read by us, and often it was translated from one language into another language, and when we, we want the best possible reading in our modern language, we look at the Hebrew, we look at the Greek, we look at the Aramaic, we look at uh, you know, a variety of stuff to try to get the very best sense in English to try to then say, okay, these smudges on the page here, what do they mean? Do I, it, inspiration means that God's idea has somehow gotten into my head without too much distortion. That's amazing. It's miraculous. Yeah. Okay. It's well, inspiration. How often do we intentionally misunderstand and it, misinterpret scriptures? It's revelation, it's inspiration, and it's illumination. Yeah. Yeah. Finally got it. <laughs> lots of fancy, fancy words there. Yeah. Well, are there any parts of the salvation paradigm that 
we think is correct that might not be correct? What percentage of Seventh-day Adventists understand Ellen White's picture of the great controversy over God's character and government? How many Seventh-day Adventists can correctly interpret the third angel's message? Remember Revelation 14, 9 to 12? You know what Billy Graham does with that? We tend to focus on Revelation 14, 12 because we like what it says. Those who, you know, keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Um, how do we understand the fire and the wrath and the forever in the third angel's message? Do we know how to interpret those things so that people can understand that this is the same God that was Jesus when he came on the, to, down to this earth? I don't know. Do you have an answer key to that? <laughs> I have an answer that would take you about five hours to go through. If you... <laughs> I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> But do you agree the first message was to the church? <coughs> the second was to, I took some notes, but I forgot. Yeah. Uh, the second went to go, ba Babylon is falling, Babylon all is falling. Okay. All the false churches. Okay. And the third is, is what? That's the, where I'm the third's <laughs> message. The third message is a message of severe warning by God to people at the end of time saying, listen up, this is your last chance. And he says, just very, very briefly, he says the fire is literally God's presence. He's a con Hebrews 29, 12, 29 says, I'm a consuming fire. The wrath means God lets people go. Lets, he gives up on them. There's nothing more he can do. And the forever means as long as it's supposed to last. And all of that can be documented extensively from the rest of Scripture, meaning that we really need to carefully understand the first 65 books of the Bible before we come to the book of Revelation. Yeah. Well, Jesus spent years focusing on teaching his disciples. Now, here's the best teacher the world has ever known. He spends night and day, 24-7, with these people for years. Now, obviously, they, at, after that, they understood everything perfectly, right? <laughs> nope. No. Well, look at Matthew 12. I'm sorry, Matthew 16, verse 21. From that time on, now the disciples, Peter has just made that wonderful confession. You know, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then it says, after some few other words, from that time on, Jesus began to say plainly to his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer much from the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. I will be put to death, but three days later I will be raised to life. Now, obviously we have been very much conditioned by our understanding of the Christian message and everything that happened. But honestly now, is there anything in those sentences that's difficult to understand? Are there any 12-cylinder uh, words? No. No. And there weren't then. No. But they were impossibilities in the framework of what, was, of what <laughs> they believed. I mean, the, the words made no sense at all in what they knew was true. Yeah. Well, Mark 8, 31 to 9, 1 repeats the idea. Mark, Luke 9, 22 to 27 repeats the idea. So he spoke it again after descending from the Mount of Transfiguration a short time later. <clears throat> Look at Matthew 17, 22 and 23. When the disciples all came together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be handed over to people who will kill him, but three days later he'll be raised to life. The disciples became very sad. I mean, did they get it or didn't they get it? Well, about, uh, let's see, it would be roughly a year later when Jesus is on his way up to, um, hold on here just a second, on his way up to Jerusalem for the last time, ready for, uh, for the Passover service, and because he knows that this is going to be his time for crucifixion, etc. We, we turn to Luke 18, verse 31. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, listen. We are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. Now, the disciples had, had seen Jesus being threatened in all kinds of ways. So you would have thought that they would be starting to get the picture. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Now, are some of you going to say to me, well, 
The reason they couldn't understand is because God hid it from them. No. I don't believe that. Was God intentional? Why would God even say it if, if it wasn't for some purpose? I mean, if it was just to go over their heads. Yeah. To hide it from them. Well, would there be a reason to even say it over and over again if they got it? He, he I mean, I mean, it's good to have this documented so it looks like that they, um, that it actually happened. He knew it was going to happen way before it happened. Yeah. It was not something that just dumped on him unexpectedly. Yeah. He knew it was going to be that way. And if they would have gotten it, I wonder if it would have... <laughs> they would have just assumed it so much they wouldn't even wrote it down. Well, was it... Here's, I, want, I want you to think about the possible problems here. Is it possible that they were so certain that Jesus was going to be the next king of Israel? He was supposed to help them conquer the Romans. The idea that he, could, he would be crucified by the Romans was unthinkable. Well, let me ask so you So they didn't this. think it. <laughs> they didn't think it. If, Even you, if, you, if you personally thought he was going to be king, wouldn't you have the same problem? Or would you have changed your mind real quickly? And, and that's a very fair question. But I'm, well, I'm going I'm I'm to turn that question back to you. Are you very certain that you know how Jesus is going to come the second time? Well, no. Absolutely. I mean, I've got some ideas, but you're right. I mean, it could be a complete surprise like it was to everybody else when he came the first time. Because everybody's expecting him to be a king, that they were going to, that they're going to whip the Romans, they were going to bring Israel back up to world power again. That they were all ready, ready for this. Now we've got our ideas about the last days. Mm -hmm. I wonder, are we going to do any better than they did? Well, that's the question. Well, <clears throat> what do we do with textual variations? I mentioned earlier that. Some copyists thought that that repetition of the name of God and Lord Jesus Christ, which was repeated twice in Second Thessalonians, should be over in First Thessalonians, and they just put it in there. Should we? How should who we feel about it? Who, inter who interviewed the copyists that did that? <laughs> well, what you what you find is this: there were there were thousands and thousands, more than a hundred thousand copies. Well, not of the whole New Testament, but manuscripts of people. parts of, yeah. of the New Testament. And what you find is that in a certain line of, of things, from a certain area, this is, what, this is what happened. Whereas in other, the copies that were copied in other areas, a, a, a larger variety of, of people in other areas is not there. So, so we have to assume... Which came that, first? We have to assume that the, the, if, that the majority were probably correct and the one who's got it different probably it happened from a, from a copyist who decided that it needed to be fixed somehow or other. But if we were to take that foundation, we would believe all kinds of crazy things that are available for us today. Well, the <clears throat> here, here's the problem. We know from, from facts, from historical evidence, that there are various ways in which the Bible, copies of the Bible were made. And in some cases, people actually sat down and read it, and then they're writing over here, and they'd read, and they write, and read, and they write. But more commonly, what happened l later in, in Christianity was someone would stand up in front and read slowly, but they would read a phrase, and, wait, and there would be maybe 10 or 15 people copying like this. Mm -hmm. And so, the, the experts, and, and there's, a, there's a very precise science called textual criticism that, that talks about this. We know that there's certain kind of mistakes that happen when you do that. A common example is if two words sound almost the same. You it wouldn't be too surprised if someone's reading it, someone is going to copy, the, he's going to hear it wrong, and they're going to read, uh, you know, they're going to they're copy down a slightly different word. Is that a spelling problem, or is that different? Because it, it's well, inaccurate. What, what if somebody has a slightly different idea of what, what a sound is supposed to look like on a page? Yeah. I mean, is, it, could that happen? Well, there's a lot of spelling differences. A lot of spelling differences, and no one takes those very seriously. But you can still make out which word it is? Yeah. Even though... Well, 
I, I, could be but there are some cases where interesting things have happened. There are cases where uh, in, in some of the early manuscripts, apparently someone wrote a note in the margin to help explain why the text is the way it is. And later on, a copy said, oh, it helps us to understand this. He just puts it in the text now instead of in the margin anymore. Are we comfortable with that? Well, I think we have to be. Yeah. Well, I kind of what, what if? It kind of, kind of. Um, I mean, it's if a you really process. wanted to study, you know, what really happened back then, if they start mm -hmm. adjusting things, you might lose that pretty fast. But but you um, you, you you get you get the the <laughs> the, the high priests of some discipline and all of a sudden what they have written in the past they have to permit to keep going and uh, it, this is a process that God has to to oversee yeah. otherwise humanity is going to have it messed up one way or another the 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 most commonly the most common well I say I put it this way the variation that is the most common that people know about but they don't know it's a variation is this you look at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, and you look at the Lord's Prayer in, in, in Luke, and in most translations, the one in Matthew will have the doxology, but the one in, the Luke, the one in Luke doesn't. The doxology, for thine is the king, the power, and the glory, and so forth. That part is not on there. Well, it turns out if you go to the oldest manuscripts, neither Matthew nor Luke has that doxology. What manuscripts are those? Those would be the original, the early papyri. The, the ones before they were even making books. And those are really, really, you know, we can date them. They're very, very early documents. So, uh, does that mean that we should not pray the doxology? Well, of course not. The, the doxology is in a lot of other prayers in other parts of the Bible. Some examples are First Chronicle, Chronicles 29, 11 and Second Chronicles 22, 6 from, from the Old Testament. So, and the only reason for mentioning all of this is that People need, you know, not, should not get real excited about some variations. One of the, probably one of the surprising variations, maybe a little bit scary, is found in, in, in John chapter 5 and verse 4. And most of the modern translations will have that either not there or it's in the footnote because it probably, almost certainly, was a marginal note at one time and then someone just put it in there. And you know, That's about the healing at the Pool of Bethesda. Well, it, the idea was that, that the, when the water was stirred up in the Pool of Bethesda, the first person jumped in there would be healed. Well, so does that, I mean, it helps us to understand why the people were there, but I, it, also make, it, it also misrepresents God. How, since I, I have this coming from the scholars, how do I sort it out? Can I go to modern prophet uh, and see how that prophet uses it and and what what source th that, that is be, used for those who have faith and trust in Ellen White that's an excellent way to go about that uh, another way is to look at a variety of versions in English uh, assuming you only read English a variety of versions and you'll see Sometimes there'll be footnotes in, in some versions. A study Bible, for example, will tell you, and you, then you need to make, the, the point is that each one of us ultimately need to make up our own mind. We, we, we should not let someone else make up their minds for us. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Does that story misrep misrepresent God, or does it make the healing of the crippled man so much more? Well, the, the idea, <coughs> The idea that misrepresents God is the idea that somehow or other, you know, the, the moving the water has some magical properties and someone jumps in there and they get healed. It was what the people thought, you see. If the, if the writer who put that little marginal note in had said, well, the people believed thus and so, it would be all right. But it just says, you know, it, it, it's true. Well, it's not really true. It's kind of using the parable of rich man and Lazarus. Yeah. It was something that was... Yeah around. Well, anyway, um, one of the reasons why there's all these variations is that in the New Testament times, as, as gradually as, as Koine Greek, the language of the New Testament, 
gradually died out and people get, got to speaking more and more Latin, people started saying, well, I know, how, I know Greek and I know Latin, let me make my own translation into Latin. And, and so then they got a little more, then people were, there were actually some people translating from Latin back into Greek because they, they liked what it said in the Latin and there were ver various variations in Latin. And so uh, this kind of stuff happened. But the good news is that there's very few places in the, in the Bible, through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, that make any difference. There are lots of small variations, but there's very few of them that make any significant difference. Well, let's come back to Thessalonians again. It's interesting to notice that Paul liked to produce very long sentences. In the Greek, 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 to 10, is one sentence. <coughs> Almost our entire passage for today is one sentence. Uh, I've heard it said that there's no punctuation, no verses, no chapters, and including no punctuation in the original. So how do you determine that there's that it's one sentence, or am I mistaken? Well, because you need to look for an, a noun and a verb and so forth. I mean, even in Greek, before you go on to another sentence, and there aren't any. There's a, a subject and a, a verb, and then until finally down to verse 11, you come to another one. Because it's true that in the, in the language as it was written in, in Jesus' day, the Greek was written in unseals, that's capital letters. There was no space between the capital letters, they just ran on continuously, and there was no punctu punctuation of any kind. So. Pay your money, take your choice. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Virtually all modern translators, translations break this sentence up into smaller pieces because we have trouble with such long sentences. We often read these verses as primarily speaking about issues concerning the second coming, but if you realize that they are all one sentence, the initial and important subject and verb are we are obligated or we ought. That's, that's what Paul is talking about. You need to understand this. So it's all, all the stuff down here is you need to understand this. So Paul was speaking about the second coming in the context of his pride in the growth and progress of the Thessalonian church. Well, look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, and 4. Our brothers and sisters, we must thank God at all times for you. It is right for us to do so because your faith is growing so much and the love each of you has for the others is becoming greater. That is why we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God. We boast about the way you continue to endure and believe through all the persecutions and sufferings you are experiencing. What do we learn from those verses? Well, one of the first things is this. In general, it's true. Basically, it's always true that if something isn't growing, it's dead or it's dying. So Paul here is saying, congratulations, the church is growing. In Thessalonica, the church is growing, and I'm, I'm thankful for it. I'm praying for you. However, we must go back and admit that he was writing the second letter to the Thessalonians, apparently mainly because they had partially misunderstood his first letter. But even so, he started out with fairly lengthy words of encouragement and affirmation for them. Notice that in these verses, instead of speaking about his favorite combination of faith, hope, and love, where do those come from that we think of almost immediately? 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, but there are a lot of other places in Paul's writings as well. Here, Paul talks about faith, love, and patience. Does that have something to do with the fact that they were suffering persecution and afflictions? Well, he got run out of there, so they probably were. Yeah. Well, what about us? Do we suffer any persecution and afflictions? Some of us do. <laughs> Some of us do, okay. Oh my goodness. Some of us do, some of us don't. I'll... Well, persecution is generally understood to be something of physical abuse or torture, and we're not going to argue about that too much. However, in this place, the word afflictions, well, it's translated in different ways, but afflictions means trials of various kinds. So now, do any of us experience trials? 
But Boy, I hope that there, I hope there's nobody here who doesn't experience trials. We all have the trials of our lives. Mm -hmm. But is that what he's talking about here? Or are the trials that he's talking about those that are associated with living the Christ life that he was trying to teach them? I and mean, we're not live, trying to live the Christ life? Well, we're not, we we're not in, a, in a position where we're trying to defend a dead man. We, all, we take that for granted. Well, yes, but would it be true that if we were a little, maybe if, if we were doing a better job of living the Christian life, we would suffer more trials and afflictions? Very possible. So there might be a problem on our end. Yes. But not only that, if you would like people to believe what you believe, Mm -hmm. And you're not going to suffer so much, but if you're interacting with people who are different, who are doing different things, then you become a mirror to them. To like, th they are wrong. It's seen so much that you, are, they, they have to despise you. You make them uncomfortable. Yeah. And then that's. I think that's when a lot of the affliction well, comes. Let, let, let's. And let me take your point. And, so and if we stay in an Adventist ghetto, we probably won't have those problems. <laughs> well, but. <laughs> And I don't know. One of the biggest problems, if you want to call it that, in the Adventist Church happened in 1888, and that was at the General Conference Committee. That's true. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's just That think. was a real ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and we can chuckle about that a little bit, but let's think seriously about this. There's a reason why we're not in the kingdom by now. Yes. We are not representing God correctly. We're not doing something right. So we're going to have to change to get it right. Am, is that fair? Some have said a total transformation. And if we go about undergoing a total transformation, what happens to the people next to us who aren't ready to transform yet? They may be very uncomfortable. With Odd, it. singular, straight-faced straight extremists. Straight-faced extremists. <laughs> some, people, some people will be, be known that way. Well, it turns out, look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 5, and 6. All of this proves that God's judgment is just, and as a result, will, you will become worthy of his kingdom, for which you are suffering. God will do what is right. He will bring suffering on those who make you suffer, and he will give relief to you who suffer and to us as well. He will do this when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven with his mighty angels with a flaming fire to punish those who reject God who do not obey the good news about our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction separated from the presence of the Lord and from his glorious might. When he comes on that day to receive glory from all his people and honor from all who believe, you too will be among them because you have believed the message that we told you. Now does that sound... In, in the meantime, ask God to help you suck it up. <laughs> well, this is very Old Testament language. In, 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 in all of First Thessalonians, the focus seemed to be more on New Testament kind of language. And now we're hitting some, some of the tougher Old Testament kind of language. So, well, it's true that the, the truth, you don't really need to defend the truth because it'll defend itself after mm -hmm. a while and it'll take no prisoners. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that, but um, you know, we've got to treat each other well, mm -hmm. even though we may be setting ourselves up for not very good things. Well, in the case of the Thessalonians who were suffering apparently physical torture and so forth, Paul reminded them that in general, violence begets what? More violence, right? Paul was saying, you know, don't, don't respond in kind. Don't get upset and don't try to, you know, fight back. Um, God will judge everyone completely fairly. Does it make you feel more comfortable when you have a, you're having trials to know that those who might be making your life more difficult will get what's coming to them? I, I, he did. Um, go ahead, Lily. Okay. I talked to Norm one, uh, a couple of, the, last week maybe, uh, and Norm said something like that, said, oh, they're only going to be here when heaven, I was like, okay, I didn't say anything else, but it was like, yeah, 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 because I want, I want to see something happen, kind of happen now, I don't, I'm not yet at the point where somebody takes some, let's say somebody take your dish and you give him that, mm -hmm. I am, I've not reached that plateau, 
And when I see something really, really wrong, sometimes it's hard for me to just say, oh, God, we'll take care of it. But that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're supposed to respond to wrong. Otherwise, it grows and it grows and it grows and it affects everybody. And then everybody's surprised. Oh. I wish we could, I wish we could had a picture of what was going on over there. I mean, were neighbors throwing rocks at them all the time? Were people <laughs> it's possible. coming up and, and dumping out all their loads of stuff, you know, and just being a pain to them just because they didn't like them? I, I think mean, they were probably taken to court and some of them probably were killed. Well, it's kind of hard to kind of put it together because... And he didn't offer them any solution until the second coming. Yeah. So am I supposed to take comfort in the words at the end of verse 6, he will bring suffering on those who make you suffer? Is that supposed to make me feel good? Well, I, I, there's another verse that might, you might want to put with that. It's found at the end of chapter 12 in Hebrews. And some people take great encouragement this, in, from this verse. It says, because our God is indeed a destroying fire. I'm supposed to take comfort from that too. Right? I mean, doesn't that make you feel just warm and fuzzy inside? No. <laughs> because we're supposed to pray for those who hurt us, pray for us, but we want them to change, to at least want to change. And if a really good person, you don't want to harm people because they harm you. You just want them to stop doing the wrong that they do. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it may but what if they don't? Well, uh, the, 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 that whole saying, though, may have the opposite effect, too, because you might be talking them in to feel sorry for those people because you know what's going to happen to them later on, you know. So mm -hmm. feel sorry for them. Don't sit there in gl with glee and say that, oh, this is going to be great. I can hardly wait. You know, well, there's two ways you can look at it. And more than that, if you say, leave it to God, he might convert those people. He might make a saint out of them. Right. Well, how do you feel about these, the rest of these verses? Do, are, you, are you happy that God is going to... Well, let, let me look at the, read the if verses. If you were to ask someone that was in the Holocaust mm -hmm. yeah. what they feel about their captors, mm -hmm. you know, there's many of them that feel very sorry for those people. Others, you know, of course don't, but I, it, it, when you read those stories, that's as close as I can get to that kind of, yeah. when we're talking about this affliction, and because that's as close as we can get at this point in time in history. When you read verse 11, mm -hmm. which, is, which is what he says, and wherefore we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. Mm -hmm. What's the calling? The suffering, mm -hmm. the suffering that's going on. Thank God that you can suffer for well, His name. Is that yeah. what He's saying? Well, the calling is really the Christian life. The suffering is the result. He's not calling you to suffer just because it's a good idea to suffer. But that's what He's trying <laughs> to comfort them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, people who believe like that, they just walk around and beat themselves and yeah, all this. They do no, in some places. I'll, I'll pass. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pass on that yeah. too. <laughs> I don't think it means that. Well. <laughs> but how much, uh, how much of what we do is to avoid discomfort of some kind? Yeah. Or to make sure that somebody doesn't think I'm a little weird? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's quite different than beating yourself on the back. Yeah. Well, but what, what do you do with verse 8? With a flaming fire to punish those who reject God and who do not obey the good news about our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what you see God doing? Lord Jesus appears with he from heaven with his mighty angels with the flaming fire? If you're in the bleachers watching that, mm -hmm. and then you're going to write down as a reporter what you saw, mm -hmm. you're going to be talking about flaming fire. Ellen White somewhere in one place says, at the second coming, the entire sky will be full of brilliant angels. But you might not, but somebody looking with their binoculars might not see angels, they might just see fire. Mm -hmm. Well, in Paul's day, well, I shouldn't say just in Paul's day, if you go back into Old Testament times, you, you notice something interesting if you do a little research behind the scenes. The ancient Assyrians, for example, uh, worshiped the god of war. 
They were a very warlike people. They were known for taking their enemies who had fought valiantly against them, beating them until they were black and blue. They're actually internally bleeding already, and then skinning them alive. Do you think their worship of the god of war influenced how they behaved? Yes. No, I'm sure it did. Yeah. Well, well, what is our picture of God? Well, not too long ago, people used to take, in France and other places, they would take people and disembowel them, yeah. and people just stand around. People coming from church would have a Bible in one hand while they're watching, and then they go home. We, we're strange people. Yeah. Well, we can be. There's no doubt about mm -hmm. it. Recently, there was a report in the news about a woman who apparently, this was in Afghanistan, a woman who apparently was being, um, well, let's say she was being approached and, and was, was being desired by two different men. And these men were leaders. Uh, and this was a problem. So since they couldn't both have her, they decided to destroy her. And they, they you know, literally, they arranged the thing like this, got her out there, she's kneeling down, she's sitting down there, and they literally shot her. And everybody else is standing around laughing. The men are standing around laughing. The Taliban are standing on laughing as she's shot because these two guys can't agree on her. I mean, what kind of, you know, what does that tell you? Well, do you think our God is going to pay back at the end with vengeance, punishment, and the affliction of suffering? No. No. Well, what do you do with it? We already read that our God is a consuming fire. Look at a couple of other verses. Look at Romans 2, verse 5. But you have a hard and stubborn heart, and so you're making your own punishment even greater on the day when God's anger and righteous judgments will be revealed. How do you make your own punishment even greater? Well, try Romans 10, I'm sorry, 12, 19. Never take revenge, my friends, but instead let God's anger do it. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay back, says the Lord. And that's why I'm a destroying fire, right? I'll do it my way. I'll do it my way. Okay. These are humans speaking in language. Yes, thank you. They can understand. I mean, yeah. it's very hard to put that feeling of frustration. I mean, when I had my iPad stolen, you know, I was frustrated, feeling violated, but I didn't want to hurt anybody. I just wanted my iPad back. I see. You know? <laughs> well, even the very best governments must deal with unrestrained evil. In its early history, America had very few prisons. Justice was often meted out with a sword or a gun. Today we have four million people incarcerated in prison somewhere, some kind or another. Does the fact that the U.S. government has so many people in prison worry you? Can we be sure that when God executes his justice and judgment, it will be fair? Will it be fair because the onlooking universe has looked over God's shoulder and decided exactly how much punishment he should mete out to every sinner? Or will it be fair because each person ultimately decides his own degree of punishment? Does sin pay its own wage? And that wage is death. I, I, Romans 6, 22. I don't... I don't I don't have information to understand that mechanism, mm -hmm. but somehow I choose to believe that sin does something to me, that when, when God turns it back like it was, I'll be destroyed. It also does something to other people, and it did it to other people, and it had the collateral damage of killing the, That's their right. creator. Mm -hmm. That's it, right. It's not just a, a isolated. Mm -hmm. So well, yes, they will die, but it's not because of some arbitrary formula that was written out and say, you get that much. Well, look at the last couple of verses in our passage for, the, for today. When he comes on that day to receive glory from all his people and honor from all who believe, you too will be among them because you have believed the message that we told you. That is why we always pray for you. We ask our God to make you worthy of the life he has called you to live. This is the verse you read to us. Mm -hmm. May he fulfill by his power all your desire for goodness and complete your work of faith. In this way, the name of our Lord Jesus will 
receive glory from you and you from him by the grace of our God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, this long sentence we've been talking about in this lesson, this week's lesson from verses 3 to 10, provides a number of important details about the second coming of Jesus. When Jesus returns, he will afflict the afflictors and provide rest for the afflicted, verses 6 and 7. He will come down from heaven in the company of powerful angels, angels, verse 7. He will come with flaming fire and execute justice on those who have rejected God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, verse 8. The wicked are destroyed, 8 and 9, while the righteous bring glory to Christ, 9 and 10. So, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, we learn from the righteous that the righteous will be taken to heaven at the second coming. Thus, this earth will be left desolate for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, 1 to 6. Having praised his Thessalonian friends in the first verses of 2 Thessalonians, Paul set the stage for some corrections that were needed. Proof that the second coming has not yet taken place is in the fact that there has not been flaming fire, destruction of the wicked, and the full glorification of Jesus in the eyes of all. So what about it? Um, if you had received this kind of a message from God, how would you take it? And coming back to our discussion we've had about how things are transmitted down to us, Selected Messages by Ellen White, Book 1, page 21, gives us this message. The Bible is not given to us in grand, superhuman language. Jesus, in order to reach men where he is, took humanity. The Bible must be given in the language of men. Everything that is human is imperfect. Different meanings are expressed by the same word. There's not one word for each distinct idea. The Bible was given for practical purposes. The stamps of minds are different. All do not understand expressions and statements alike. Some understand the statements of the scriptures to suit their own particular mind in cases. Prepossessions, -pre prejudices, and passions have a strong influence to darken the understanding and confuse the mind, even in reading the words of Holy Writ. The Bible was written by inspired men, but is not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put himself in words and logic and rhetoric on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible were God's penmen, not his pen. Look at the different writers. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on men's words or expressions, <coughs> but on the man himself, who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts. So, we may feel uncomfortable with some of these words, but remember, these are the words of Paul under the inspiration of God, and we should take them as such. See you next week.